This recording was produced by Oregon Trail Baptist Church. If you'd like to get more recordings or to leave your feedback, please visit us at www.otbchurch.com or write us at P.O. Box 298, Guernsey, Wyoming, 82214. We look forward to hearing from you, and we hope that today's recording will not just challenge your thinking, but will transform your life. Micah chapter 6 this morning in your Bibles. Micah chapter number 6. Micah chapter 6. Right after the book of Jonah, before the book of Nahum, Micah chapter 6. It is the 4th of July this week, and as several of our patriotic songs have already mentioned, what is it that, what is one of the features that makes America great? What's that? What's one of the features that makes America a great nation? Okay, freedom, worship. Okay, we got religious freedoms. Okay, freedom of speech and those type of. Okay. Now let me ask you a question: freedom of privacy. Yeah, that's that's true. Yeah, um, that's slowly going by by. Of course, about all of them are slowly going by 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 by. Freedom is something that is important to our country and our nation. But freedom means very little without something else. It does. Freedom costs a lot. But freedom without justice fails to be free. And, and that's what I'm going to get at here this morning. Is that Generally when we think of our land and our country, and the question I guess, I, what makes a nation great? Freedom alone won't do it. There are other countries in the world that have freedom. Now, maybe not all the freedoms we have, but there are, there's freedom of religion in a lot of countries around the world, and there's, there's a lack of it in many others. There's a freedom of speech in many countries. There's a freedom of politi- political aspects and, and a freedom of religion. There's a lot of freedoms in other countries of the world today. But I would like to propose here this morning that more important to freedom is justice. And we'll get into that here this morning. Micah, we'll start reading at verse 1. We're going to read here uh, the first eight verses. Um, The key verse for this morning is verse 8, Micah 6, 8. But let's read the first um, eight verses here, and then I'll give you some background to what's going on here in the book of Micah. And then we'll drill down on verse 8 here this morning. Micah chapter 6, verse 1. Hear ye now what the Lord saith. Arise, contend thou before the mountains, and let the hills hear thy voice. Hear ye, O mountains, the Lord's controversy, and ye strong foundations of the earth. For the Lord hath a controversy with his people, and he will plead with Israel. O my people, what have I done unto thee? And wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me. Uh, Let me pause here. The language here in this passage um, is very deliberate. It's very legal. Okay, so the idea, testify against me, I have a controversy with you. Um, I'm not saying that as much from just the English side. The, The Hebrew language scholars have noted, this is God saying, all right, let's go to court. Me and you. And, and let's, let's settle this out. And the irony is also God is the judge, um, but he is, he's weighing out 
the good and the bad of the nation and how they've responded to him. And he's right here calling, hey, what have I done wrong unto you? Verse 3. O oh, my people, what have I done unto thee, and wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me. For I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, and redeemed thee out of the house of servants. I sent um, before thee Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, consulted, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, and answered from Shittim to Gilgal that ye may know the righteousness of the Lord. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord? There's a shift here. Verse 6 is Micah putting himself in the position of coming before the Lord um, to plead the cause. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with a thousand, with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give the, uh, my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this text of scripture. And as we look at it this morning, we recognize you are talking to the nation of Israel. And yet, as we are living as Americans in our nation, in America, Lord, we recognize that it's only when we follow your word and your laws and we live by the principles and the truths that you have ordained that we truly will find ourselves blessed. And Lord, you've given here, in a certain sense, a a simple formula, or uh, maybe that might not be the best way to express it, but some key elements of what would make a good nation and what makes good sense in our own lives. What is it that pleases you? And and Lord, as we look at this this morning, we ask for your guidance in our our thoughts and thinkings, and we ask for your Holy Spirit to to provoke and, and convict us in our hearts. And Lord, just show us the areas that we need to change to be more conformed to you. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. The book of Micah has been kind of a series of attacks and then a little section of hope. Uh, Micah is is coming before uh, the people of Israel and he condemns them for their problems and then he, he'll, he'll relent from that a little bit and give a little hope. Uh, our key verse here, verse 8, it's actually, um, it's, it's engraved or in a monument in the congressional library in the reading room to that library. It's one of the verses that they've put up there. He's shown the old man what is good and what does the Lord require of thee. Now, we already mentioned that people view what makes America great differently. As believers, we're going to always connect that back to what's made America great is its, its founding, where our founding fathers, and, and even those who were not necessarily Christian, they, they believed in a God, and they believed that we ought to be able to pursue our, our faith in a way we see fit. Uh, if you do your historical study, it is interesting. I'll plug in a little Baptist point here. The only state that was founded by Baptists was Rhode Island. And that's about the only of the original states that did not kill people or persecute them for their faith. You say, wait a minute. I thought America had religious freedom. Not quite. <laughs> it was more freedom of denominations, and I'm sorry, but Baptists, uh, you can read some history of Baptists being whipped in American courtrooms till they're bloody and bleeding, and I can give you the book with documented on that. It wasn't always this way, okay? Um, yes, the pure, or pilgrims came over to establish freedom, um, but it wasn't always that the way it is today. Our Declaration of Independence states, we hold these truths to be self evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now Micah here says, 
He has shown thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require thee, but to do justly. Now, justice is not there in our Declaration of Independence, but the concept is. And it's coming from Scripture, and it's coming from passages like this in Micah. And Micah has been railing on the corruption of the people of Israel. He's this chapter, he's putting it into a courtroom setting. He's, he's really putting Israel on trial and putting God there as well. And, and God has done everything right. And in verse 2 here, God has a bone to pick with Israel. He has a controversy to pick with them. And God he says, hear, hear ye, O mountains. God is calling on the mountains to be his witness. Um, a phrase or two later says, and ye strong foundations of the earth. Now, in the ancient world view, um, they viewed the mountains as what held up the sky. Kind of weird to us, but when you read the book of Job, it, they thought the firmament, the sky, was a solid dome, um, which is some, where some of the phrasing of like heavens is brass and things come from. And they viewed the mountains as what held that up. Okay? God's calling on the very foundations of the earth, in essence, of what their understanding was, to be a witness against his people. He's pleading with them. He has this controversy with them. Verse 4, he describes how I took you out of Egypt. I redeemed you. I brought you out of slavery. You see how justice is also connected with freedom here. There is a connection between the two. Because in Egypt, were they free? No. Pharaoh wouldn't let them go out in the wilderness for a few days to, to worship. He wouldn't let them do what they wanted to do to, to worship their God. Let me rephrase that. He wouldn't let them do what God called them to do to worship God. They weren't free. And Pharaoh at that point was the enemy. But the truth is, as Israel history, Israelite history went on, they became their own worst enemy. As they came into the promised land, they were supposed to stay distinct and different from the Canaanites. And in the end, they were just the same as the Canaanites. They worshipped their gods. They followed their practices. They sacrificed their children. They did the same thing. A verse 5 here of the text um, says, O my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, consulted, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him from Shittim unto Gilgal, that ye may know the righteousness of the Lord. Now, I covered this recently, but this is referring back to the book of Numbers. And what a boring name for a book, but in Hebrew it means the wilderness or the wilderness wanderings. And here the book of Numbers is this this cycle of events as, as God's people, who he redeemed, he gave freedom to, he established them as a nation, he makes his covenant with them, he provides for them, they complain about the manna. They complain about the water. They complain about this. They complain about that. They complain about Moses' leadership. They, the group wants to split off and go back to Egypt. And it's one failure after another to trust God. The God who parted the Red Sea. The God who brought them out of Egypt. The God who rained ten plagues on on. Egypt and destroyed everything of Egypt. Their economy, their military, everything was wiped out. And they have the gall to complain. <laughs> Isn't it true? It's just like today. And the book at Numbers ends with this really weird story. And it's got Balaam, who is a, he's not a prophet of God. He's, he's more of a, a pagan soothsayer, is really kind of more what he is. And he's, the king summons him, and, and it's kind of odd because Balaam here, I mean, God says to him, and God is not limited to who he speaks to. Okay? God does not have to only speak to his followers. But God says to Balaam, no, don't go to the king. And says that two times, and finally the third time, God says, fine, go. And we get the story of the talking donkey and how God was upset with Balaam and, and this, that, and the other. Well, Balak, the king, has Balaam stand up there on the hill and Balaam's job is to curse Israel. And as Balaam goes to curse them, 
he blesses them. Balak, is the king, is not so happy. So Balak brings him to another little hill or, or mountain overlooking the camp of Israel and says, now curse them here. Maybe you know a different location will help. And he blesses them. And this happens two or three times. And Balak is flustered with Balaam. And why do you keep... He says, I can't help it. This is what God is wanting to do here. Isn't that completely ironic? That in the mountains, where Israel doesn't see what's going on, there are those who are invoking powers and curses on God's people. And God is protecting his people. God is shielding his people. And God is showing that the, to this king and this prophet of the false gods, he's showing them, look, you can't touch my people. And while God is doing that to his people, what are his people doing? We don't like your leadership, Moses. We don't like this manna. We don't like this. We don't like that. So here God is, as Micah is portraying this, God has protected and provided and cared for his people from the evil forces without, while within they're complaining and murmuring and really just sticking it to God. God has been faithful to his people when they have been unfaithful and ungrateful to him. And so this, I mean, this is what Micah is referring back to with this story of Balak and Balaam as they were cursing it, or trying to curse Israel God was blessing them and providing for them. This is how good God was. And yet Israel continued to turn their backs on God. Uh, verse, verses 6 and 7 here. Um, Therefore night... Um, excuse me, wrong. Forgot to turn the page. Um, uh, Wherefore shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God... Shall I come before him with burnt offerings and with calves a year old? Micah's putting himself as, you know, what is it that, that I can do and come before God and make things right? Will it, will it be to them a, a calf of a year old was the premium sacrifice? It was the best uh, to give. Um, bowing yourself, I mean, showing subservitude to the Lord, to, to honor and respect him. Verse 7, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or ten thousands of rivers of oil? Now, not that anyone even had the economic means to do this, but would all of that please the Lord? Shall I give, and this is where it gets interesting, shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? Now, I don't think Micah here is referring to actually doing this. I think he's mocking Israel. And the reason I say that is, Israel, one thing God hated was child sacrifice. All through scripture. And he didn't want his people to become like the Canaanites and get involved in that. But as we read to the judges, we have the story of Jephthah, and I know it's a debated story, and I've told you my... But Jephthah is so unfamiliar with the God of Israel, he's willing to sacrifice his daughter to keep a vow he made. So the first thing that comes out of my house, I'm going to kill it as a sacrifice to the Lord. And you say, well, why would there be animals in the house? Well, that's how they did things back then. They'd have a courtyard in the house. They'd keep the most valuable animals in the house to keep them protected from being stolen and whatnot at night and things. Um, and that carries on in the New Testament times. But Jephthah's expecting something else to walk out of his house, not his daughter. But by the end of the book, God's people have so forsaken his laws, they don't know their own God. In fact, as we read outside of the Bible, and even some in the Bible, there were some Israelites who thought they were worshiping Yahweh when they worshiped the sun. There were some who thought they were worshiping Yahweh when they worshiped these other deities or whatever and whatnot. You say, well, how do you know? That's kind of odd. When they came out of Egypt, what's the first thing they did in rebellion? 
made a golden calf. Golden calf, the calf was was the symbol of Baal. Baal was pictured with a symbol. It was it was it was a symbol of strength and it was a symbol of the gods. It was it was Baal's icon or symbol. And whether they got this out of Egypt or whether they got this out of Canaan, the first thing they do is make a golden calf and say, This is what brought us out of Egypt. Micah here is is really pulling Israel on the carpet because they couldn't seem to stay away from all the trouble. They couldn't keep out of, of the idolatry and the false worship. God had even sent them into Egypt to incubate them from the Canaanites. You say, how does that work? Well, because they were shepherds, Egyptians did not respect or like shepherds. In fact, Joseph says to his father when they're coming into Egypt, he says, hey, don't tell Pharaoh you're a shepherd, okay? Don't tell him that, all right? Keep it under wraps. They lived in the land of Goshen. They kind of had their own community. They had um, their own little thing going on there. They were incubated to some degree from Egypt. Why? Because they couldn't keep themselves away from the Canaanites. And they kept incorporating their gods and their worship and all that. And they get out of Egypt and they... Do it right away with a golden calf. And on through their history, they do it over and over and over. They turn to the gods of the Canaanites and they even get involved in the sacrifice of children. Read through the the story of the kings and how in that time they would sacrifice to Molech. And I've illustrated it before, but Molech was often made as a big iron statue. Um, They would build a fire that was inside the statue, so it was kind of like a furnace and they had, to that statue, arms that would hold a baby. And they would put a child in those arms. And as the iron from the fire would heat up, that child would begin to squirm. And so as the arms were at, a, at the right angle, as the fire heated up and the, arms, the iron arms would get hot, that child would squirm and fall into the cavity of the god Molech, the idol there, and be consumed. Folks, I'm not for the abortion today. But what happens in a medical room today, I just don't see on the same level as I see watching your child go through that. Now, I am not for abortion, and I think it's wrong, and I think it's murder. But there's a certain level to where we're not quite there yet. Okay? But that's what they were doing. They turned their back on God. They turned to every other God, and God is now calling them on the carpet. Well, that leads us into the verse, I said was our main one for this morning. He hath shown thee, O man, what is good. Is this sacrifice to Molech good? No. Is worshiping Baal and Ashtoreth and all the false gods good? No. Is it good to offer these sacrifices of oil and, and rams? Well, yes, those can be good. But the, God's point here is, look, to, to come up and to offer all this stuff when your heart is still there worshiping Molech or worshiping Baal or worshiping Astroth, when you're, when you're going to offer me an offering and then you're going to turn around and go to their false temples and their false gods, it means nothing. And Micah here alludes to, he says, he hath shown you. I'm not telling you something new. He's he's probably referring back to Deuteronomy 10, where God says, And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God? They didn't do that. To walk in his ways? They didn't do that. To love him? They failed on that one. And to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul? They were double-souled. They were constantly looking to the other gods. Verse 13 of Deuteronomy 10. To keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee this day for thy good. Elsewhere in Micah, he describes how they would come with their offerings to to offer to God. In the meantime, they're being unfair and unjust to their fellow Israelite. Kind of the idea of, of some people who who live how they want during the week, but they pretty pretty up and they get everything nice to come to church on Sunday. You live how you want every uh, Monday through Saturday, but okay, Sunday's the Lord's Day. I've got to clean up that day. 
it doesn't please God. So here he says, in response to this, he's shown you what's good. He's shown you what it re- is required to please the Lord. And he gives us three things. He says, but to do justly. Now the leaders of Israel at this time were corrupt. Um, earlier in the book, uh, Micah alludes to the story of Ahab stealing Naboth's vineyard. And, and the leaders through Israel's history have, have constantly been corrupt and concerned about their own wealth. And, and they've been th- really thieves and greedy. Micah also in the book has, has spoken against the prophets of Israel. You say the prophets, aren't they supposed to be the spokesmen for God? Yeah, they are. But Micah says, look, these prophets have their hand out. They're waiting for some money from the leaders and they prophesy to whoever what they want to hear. You want a good report? You want something good to say? Okay, I'll tell you what you want to hear. So for the right price, they say what you want to hear. They're there to tickle the ears. Uh, In chapters 3 to the first part of chapter 4, Micah describes the injustice of Israel's leaders, how they were taking land from the poor and they were selling it, land that they couldn't sell because of family obligations and laws. They were directly violating the Torah and making money and profit off of it. And in chapter 6 to 7, both what we're dealing with here and on into the next chapter, uh, they're just dealing with the, the unjust economic practices where they took advantage of the poor and they robbed the poor uh, by, by really just keeping them in their own poverty. And God's people were crooked. And then they'd come with an offering to God. Here, will this lamb make you happy? Now, we've, many of us here have had children or, or grandchildren or, or people who were close to us. And if they turn their back on us and they, they spit in our face and they do all sorts of stuff to hurt, to hurt us and then they throw us a few bucks and say, I'm sorry, is that going to really please us? Why would it please God? You see, God is, is interested in true repentance, not a facade. And they were putting on a facade of faith. They're putting on a facade of justice. They're putting on a facade, trying to, on one side of their mouth, please God, and the other side, get ahead in the world as much as possible, and it doesn't matter who I step on to do it. It's our job as believers, as followers of God, to do right by others. And we can only do right if we love God and love our neighbor. Um, It's our job to do right by the poor. I think this is one of the reasons why America has become a great nation. In many senses, yes, we fought wars that we really didn't need to fight. But we fought wars in which... Those who couldn't defend themselves, we defended. And I understand there's politics involved, and I understand there's not always a clean-cut good and bad guy. I understand that. But the aspect of justice in our country, justice and freedom paired together has, has been one of the factors that make America great. When we were in Uganda, um, I wrote an update about this, and the title for the update was, it actually, it was one of the few times I had a good title. Uh, love lifted me, but someone else lifted the generator. And what had happened was that in the middle of the night, someone came and cut the fence, stole the generator. <coughs> and we could see in the morning, they drugged the thing. Now, you drag a big old generator through a field, you're going to see where it went. We got the local authorities. They wouldn't allow us to touch it, and they wouldn't touch it. Because the trail of that drug generator led to the, it's called LC3, it'd be like a local mayor type thing, led to his cousin's house or whatever. So they wouldn't touch it. That is common in Africa. That is common in Uganda and South Africa and Kenya. It's common to have that level of corruption. What do you think that does? That means everyone has to spend more money and more expenses to protect what they do have. That means everyone has to 
guard what they have more than anything else. And it, it stops people from even wanting to try. Illustration I read in a book, it really makes a lot of sense. Has a truck driver driving with a product from one side of Cameroon to another. And he starts with, let's say, 100 cases of something. And at the first checkpoint, the police officer says, you, you need to pay me a case. Well, there's no tariff on this. I don't owe you anything. Yes, well, I have gun and you do not. This is an officer, an enforcer of the law. What option do you have? So, after making it from one side of the country to the other, you start up with 100 cases, you end up there with 50. Why do you think the price of products is so high? Why do you think the road systems are so horrible? When we were in Uganda, there was a dam project that for three, it had been funded, but for three years had nothing had happened because the money was gone. Embezzled. Now, that sounds vaguely familiar uh, to some of our systems today in America. But overall, America has established a system of justice that is fair. Now, I'm not saying it's always right. Because as long as there are humans and as long as there are people, there will be sinfulness within any governmental system, even no matter how just it is. But most of us are not afraid about a cop pulling us over and taking our money. Now, we might be if there were speeding or we have a taillight out or something. You know, we'll be worried about a ticket maybe. But we're not too worried about the cop taking our money and sticking it in his own pocket. Could it happen? Yeah. It might. Ha- stuff like that might happen. But it's the exception, not the rule. As long as they get caught. But see, that's leading back to when it, when it starts happening, once someone ha- catches it, America has tried to serve justice. Micah says, hey, God's shown you what's good. Do right. Do justice. Do right by one another. Um, he goes on to say, and I, and I truly believe that's one of the things that has made America great, not just the freedom, but the justice. It's impacted our, for our criminal justice system. It's impacted our economy. If you're a business opening up in Africa, you have to spend a ton of money into expenses and labor just to protect your product. And you lose a ton of money just by shipping it halfway across the country. But in America, if you want to start a business, this is still the place where people come to start businesses. You want to start a company. Yes, there is a ton of legal paperwork. I understand that. I understand there's a lot of red tape even here in America. But... If someone comes and opens your garage and steals all your stuff, and you know who it is, justice will be served. You generally can run your business. You can run your operation. You can do what you want. You're free to open that uh, and do that type of thing. So justice has created for us as Americans, by following that simple command that, that Micah has laid out here, justice has been one of the features that's made our country great. Uh, It's good for our society. It's good for our safety and security. Now, most of us, I know where I'm living, most of us have guns in our house, and yes, we we have no problem with um, the idea of bearing arms, and and we we are fully um, ready and willing to use that if necessary. Um, We don't necessarily plan to, but uh, we're ready for that. But we feel safe and secure. Most of the ranches out here have a barbed wire fence. And that's good enough. Now, oh yeah, okay, yes, I know. There's always, there's always your army. There's, the there, there's always the exceptions, but the exceptions are so few, we don't have to put up brick walls. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> True. True, but that's, that's more for the animals than the humans. Uh, but you, we live in such a free and just society where we expect justice. It's more common to, to see justice served than it is injustice. Now again, it, it can be wrong. It can be flipped on its head. I understand that. Um, but secondly here, not just justice, but mercy. Now the word mercy, we instantly maybe think of not getting what I do deserve. And that's probably part of it. But the word also carries more of the... 
the aspect of kindness or loving kindness or loyalty and love. America as a nation, one of the things that has made us great is that we have paid the backs to help the world. You look at United Nations. That we've recently had some documents that our president refused to sign um, because America would be paying the back for a bunch of stuff that we're already paying the bill for. I mean, America sends relief all around the world. When Haiti and, and Dominican Republic had that uh, uh, hurricane hit, what nation sent the money and sent the aid and sent the help? It was America. And America is probably the only place in the world you see something called a GoFundMe campaign where people put on the internet, I need money for this or that, and other people actually give them money. And this isn't the government giving them money, this is other people. You talk to some of the soldiers and stuff who are on tour over in Asia, and, and I talked to one guy who was in the Navy, and he said, we were on a humanitarian tour. I said, I thought you were the military. What are you doing? <laughs> He's like, well, we're just giving aid to all these countries. I'm like, oh, okay. Now, I don't care what your position on the aid is or not. America has been very generous around the world. And we've got the debt to prove it. <laughs> But the truth is, we've shown mercy. And I think with our, within America, within some of how we help people, we are actually hurting them because of how we do it. But in your life and mine, sometimes we can become so affixed on, I want justice to be served for this person, that we forget God is a God of mercy too. And someone who's willing to turn their heart and repent He gives mercy. Proverbs said, Whoso confesseth and forsaketh his sin shall have mercy. It doesn't say you won't have the consequences. It says there's going to be mercy. It's not going to be as bad as it could be. And we must be a people. God doesn't care about our religious facade if we're unkind and unloving to those around us. And the third thing here. God doesn't care about a religious facade if we avoid him. It says here, um, at the end of the verse, and to walk humbly with thy God. I think as a wholesale, our nation has been on a path of walking away from God. But I think the word humble is important. Even as Christians, we can get stuck in our little citadels where we think we have everything right, And I'll tell you this much, I know I don't have everything right, and someday I'm going to get to heaven and God's going to correct me. And God's going to correct you. And we're going to get all straightened out one day. But until that day, I'm looking at God's Word, I'm trying to live in light of what I see in God's Word, I'm trying to be accurate and teach what is clear to me from God's Word, and I'm humble enough to say I may be wrong. And someone who is humble recognizes the constant need to walk with God. You ever met those know-it-alls? Oh, so-and-so is doing this and this is what they need and this is how they need it and this is what needs to be done. And it's like, are you God? Do you understand what's going on behind in that person's life? Do you understand the details? Or And I'm not excusing sin. Proverbs talks about um, the man who who steals to feed himself because he's starving, you have pity on that man. But the man who commits adultery, you don't. Look, yeah, we, we understand when someone is starving to death, if they steal something for food to eat, we're understanding it doesn't justify what they did. It doesn't make it right. We are a little bit more understanding. Look, God wants us to walk with him you don't have your life completely figured out. What makes you think you got the next guys figured out? Just walk with God. And if you do right, if you're just with all those around you, and if you show mercy to those around you, and you simply walk with a humble attitude towards God, depending on Him to know what to do for each step along the way, that is a life that pleases God. 
It won't be your tithe or offering. It won't be your ministry you do. It won't be all these other things. It'll be simply doing what you know is right, showing kindness and love to others, and walking humbly with God. The Israelites didn't get it. But are we any better? Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this text of Scripture. and What a, a reminder it is for us, Lord, that we, we need to always do justice in our lives. We may, as, as Americans, look at our political system. We may look at our leaders and we may lament choices and decisions. We may reject ideas and philosophies. But Father, would you help us to pray for those who are in leadership over us? Would we as individuals do what's right? And Lord, we ask that our nation would make right choices as well. Lord, would you help us as individuals to show love to our neighbors? Would the love of Christ be seen through us? And Lord, would it not just be some sort of show and facade that we put on but rather would it be stemmed from a, a walk with you or we humbly listen to what you have to say. We reject the whispers of the world and we, we just walk humbly and submissively with you, seeking to have our lives be conformed to the image of Christ and to touch those around us. Lord, don't let us be like Israel and neglect your warnings, neglect what you've done. Would you give us that soft heart that is pliable to your word? We ask this in your son's name. Amen.